Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Thank you, Travis. It's been a great joy to be here this weekend. We've met quite a lot of people. We have received our, our, a big impartation into our lives. It's nothing like traveling to different parts of the world and feeling you've just walked into your front room. It's like being home, so it's been wonderful. So thank you for your love. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your hospitality. American hospitality is always wonderful. We've been in Charlotte. We went to St. Louis. Uh, we then went to D.C. and We flew out here. And we've just been enriched by so many people that have blessed us. Actually, and, and the food's amazing. And um, when I arrived, I looked like Jared just two weeks ago. And now, <laughs> look what's happened to me now. So I'm getting back to the gym as soon as I get back home and trying to work it out. Um, and uh, just talking a little bit longer so that you can get used to my London accent. When Tom Shaw comes, you're going to have to get used to his accent. I've known Tom since he was saved and so I've got stories about him if you want to chat to me afterwards I'll be very pleased to pass some of the stories on to him that you don't know about but he's going to be a great blessing to you as a church community as well so have you, are you, can you understand me I do talk a little bit fast I'm just trying to communicate with you good um, wherever I go in America people would say to me things like man I just love your accent and um which is a bit weird because I come from the original English language and I, I want to say, I think you've got the accent. I think I've got the original. Um, but it's great. It's great ordering food and having people not understanding why you... And I've given up on aeroplanes. I've just given up asking for water. Um, as a steward, stewardess says, sir, sorry, sir, so can I have a glass of water? Can I have some water, please? I don't think we have any of that here, sir. <laughs> so I give in and I say, do you have any water? Oh, we've got plenty of water. So, can I have some tomato juice, please? No, sir, we don't have any tomato juice. How's about tomato? Oh, we've got plenty of tomato juice. And so it goes on. Uh, Travis asked me if I would uh, speak to you this morning on a vision, uh, having a vision for the local church, having a vision for the kind of church that Jesus is building, maybe something that the Bible speaks about in terms of the local church. Um, it's a strange subject. Some of you are already switching off because you think, oh, really? We, we've come to talk about Jesus. Why are we going to talk about the church, but I hope this, you'll see this morning that what we're going to talk about is absolutely relevant to every person in this room. Liz and I were raised in a um, uh, very legalistic, evangelical kind of church background. Uh, people did love Jesus, but it was a lot of rules and regulations, which consequently meant that we both, uh, in separate church environments, just rebelled. So the problem with the law is it, it's it's geared up for you to rebel against it. It's kind of like if you see a sign that says, don't step on the grass, what is the first thing you want to do? It's just something inherent in that. And so you're raised in church, but if you don't know Jesus, then it just all seems to be like lots of things you have to try and do in order to keep up. It, it's hopeless. I mean, I heard the gospel every Sunday, week after week. I used to go... Uh, actually to four meetings on Sundays. And by the time you're 14 or 15 and you're still going to four meetings on Sundays and you still don't know Jesus, it's a really, really painful thing to have to kind of live in. And uh, it was just meeting after meeting after meeting and I was rebelling and rebelling and, and antagonistic towards this thing, causing as much trouble in church as I could. In fact, I was the most troublesome child in our local church, just constantly causing trouble, causing other people to cause trouble with me. 
Um, and it's like there came a moment in my life where I met some people who, who didn't just seem to be following the rules, but they really did seem to know Jesus. And for the first time in my life, I met people and I thought, if that's a Christian, then that's what I want to be like. Someone that understands the grace of God and someone who lives it out in their daily kind of lives. And so we got raised in this kind of environment, but then we got saved. And then we were living in a time when the Holy Spirit was really moving. And so we both, again in different churches, got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And at that time, the church that we went to, it was... It just wasn't a church that I wanted to bring my non-Christian friends to. It was a bit embarrassing. The English word would be cheesy. It just was a bit embarrassing to bring people along to something like this. I really didn't think it would communicate with them. I thought it would put them... I thought it was irrelevant to a lot of my non-Christian friends. And a combination of being filled with the Spirit led us to investigate in the Bible what the Bible had to say about church, we kind of knew there was something wrong, something needed to change. And through being filled with the Spirit and going to the Word, and it's an interesting thing, we do need to be churches that are filled with the Spirit and love the Word of God. They're not opposites to one another. It was Jesus who said, you will worship in spirit and in truth. Those two things go to he- together. They're friends in the Bible. And we need to be churches that passionate about the Word of God. Everything we believe is in the Word of God. How we do church is in the Word of God. Everything... But we also want to be filled with the Holy Spirit over and over and over again. So we're word spirit people. And that led us to kind of investigating the Bible and and really discovering that the Bible had a lot to say about what a local church should look like. And it changed our whole view. And we set out on a journey, which we're still on 40 years later, which is to try and encourage people to have an expression of church life that is biblical. And the interesting thing about this word this morning, I could be preaching um, in Australia, I could be preaching in Central Africa, I could be preaching this down in Mexico or Canada, I could be preaching it on an island in the Pacific. The word is still the same. You have different cultures in different nations that you visit, and that means you have different expressions of what you have, but you have exactly the same values, and you have exactly the same model of church that we need to build on. So we got really passionate about church. We were already very passionate about Jesus. We were loving him through the word. We were being filled with his Holy Spirit. We just loved him so much. But we wanted to see a church emerge that we could love as well and be proud to be a part of. Because in the end, at the end of the day, you cannot be passionate about Jesus and not be passionate about his church. I don't know whether it's true here, but in London where I live, there's lots of people who, who know Jesus and they love him, but they're not interested in church. I mean, they might go occasionally, maybe once a month on a Sunday, but church is something that they kind of almost avoid. It's something they give a wide berth. They just don't. Maybe they've been hurt. Maybe they've had experiences of church that's put them off, but they really, really are not convinced that church is something that's good news. And also in my country, we have a lot of people I think are quite interested in Jesus. But when it comes to church, it's just a turn-off. They're just not interested in church at all. They don't want anything to do with this. And right in Scripture, you see this amazing story of of, um, Paul, who is then called Saul, who is on a journey to persecute Christians. He's on a journey to, to persecute the church. He hates Christians. He hates the church. And then some of you know this story. He's... He's there and there's this great light that shines and he falls to the ground and he hears a voice. And it's the voice of Jesus who says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And if you read the passage, it's very strange because Saul says, I don't really even know who you are. I'm not persecuting you, I'm persecuting the church. So Jesus Jesus doesn't say to Paul, 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 why are you persecuting the church? He says, why are you persecuting me? In other words, as far as Jesus is concerned, there is no difference between the church and himself. He puts the two things together. The church is his bride. He loves his bride. We should love Jesus, but we should also love his bride. Have you got that? It's kind of like Jesus, church, tomato, tomato. It's kind of, there's just no difference between the two things. So it's really, really sad when I'm surrounded by people who say, I love Jesus, 
but I can't stand his bride. I really don't like the one that he loves. And because Jesus loves the bride, he's saying, I'm so glad that you love me, but I really want you to love my people. I really want you to love my church. I want you to love the bride of Christ, my bride. And even with people around us who say, I love Jesus, and then they say, I'm not sure about the church. It's kind of a weird thing to say. It's like not a normal thing to say. And so for Liz and I, on this journey together, we just started to get more and more revelation about Jesus and his church. And this resulted in us feeling a sense of being ruined. I don't know if the word ruined means something to you, but ruined is where you get such a vision, nothing else will ever, ever satisfy. You're ruined for something. It's like young leaders that I work with in church. I say to them, one of the first things you should ever learn as a leader is you can't do this on your own. You just cannot lead in your own strength. You're not even meant to. But the Holy Spirit has come to help you to lead the people of God. And the first thing you should do is be ruined in terms of I can't do this. That's a great place to be in. Because when you can't do it, you know God will come and he'll do it through you. And when you've got a vision of certain things, you just get ruined. I got kind of ruined for this vision of local church. So I'm a nice pastoral guy, but I might never come back here again. And I've also noticed that the older I get, the less I care about what people think. So I am, and I'm English, so even there, you know, it's just nice and kind of me. But my prayer this morning is this. There'll be some of us sitting here today that will get a little bit more revelation of this vision of the church and that some of us will get ruined. My prayer before the meeting today was, Lord, will you please ruin some Americans here this morning? I want some people in this church, in this radiant church, to get so affected by what God's word says about the local church. Whatever your past experience And that once again, you'll come again and say, Jesus, I really do love you. And you're going to hear him saying, and will you love my people? Will you love my bride? Will you have a cause to live for and even worth dying for? Which is for Jesus. But what he's really passionate is about us, his local church. If you have your Bibles with you, you might like to turn turn to this passage in Acts chapter 2. And I'm just going to read, these are familiar words, Acts chapter 2 verse 42. It says, and they, the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need, and day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now I could read that passage of scripture very carefully to you, and you could have read this before your own self, but I want to just take you from the passage and lead you to have a kind of response to those verses this morning. And the first response is this. Does that look like Radiant Church, what we've just read? Does that describe the church that you go to? I think of this church that I am a part of in London, and I look at these verses, and I can honestly say to you, there are certain aspects of verses 42 to 47 that I think, yes, we are experiencing some of these things. But if I'm really honest, there's a whole lot of things here that we just still are not experiencing. In fact, I have to say to you, I don't know any church that I've ever visited in the world that is actually living out these verses. This sense of dedication and devotion to the the Lord and to one another, this sense of awe and wonders and miracles and this sense of being together and being in their homes and sharing their food with one another and and, and meeting all together and in different places and praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord adding daily to their number those who are being saved. It's, it sounds remarkable. It sounds amazing. But this is the challenge. Is this passage of Scripture written to just mock me? 
<laughs> so that every time I read it, I find myself going, wow, that is amazing. That's like a dream. Is it there just mocking me? It's just kind of like a vision of the church and a dream of the church that's never really going to happen. It's like it's dangled before me, and every time I grab it, it's taken away at the last minute. This scripture it mocks us. It's, it just, it's a description of local church that's beyond most of our experience. So is that why it's there? It's a bit weird to have something in the Bible that is written and declared that you can never actually experience or attain to. Or, is this passage of scripture written not to mock us, but to be a model to us of what normal local church should be like? I'm not there in this passage of scripture. I'm not there experiencing all of these things. But I absolutely believe that it is a model, an example of the kind of church that we are meant to be today. I'm giving my life for this. And this is not something that leaders give their life to. It's we, the body of Christ, every one of us. They have such a passion that when we find ourselves reading Acts 2, 42 to 47, we're going, Lord, do it again. I really believe that this is here, not to mock me, but it's here as an example, as a model. One of the things we found when we were trying to put, through the word and the spirit, trying to find out what should church look like, it wasn't like we were trying to look around the world. We were never going to discover this on internet. We were never going to discover by looking at the future, we'd come up with some brand new idea that no one's ever thought about how church should be done. We found it all here in the Word of God. We found it model after model, example after example of the sort of church that we should be. So the first thing when you look at that passage is to ask the question, is that an impossible dream or can it become a living reality? I'll leave it up to you to decide what you think. I already know what the leaders of this church think and I agree with them. <laughs> that this is absolutely the example of church that, that radiant church here in Visalia ought to be. The second thing, and it's a simple question you have to ask is, was this just written as a model of church for the first century only, or was it something declared for the 21st century here in California? It's a simple question, but you have to answer it for yourself. I come from a background where many things that we were taught was, yes, those things are in the Bible, but they were only experienced by the first century church, and we don't experience those things anymore. So I was taught very faithfully by people that, that spiritual gifts were only for the first century, and after that they disappeared. And I, being a young Christian, said, please can you show me a Bible verse where it says that? And no one ever came back to me with that answer. I passionately believe that the verses of Scripture we've just read are not just for the first century, but for every century that follows, including the 21st century. Is this, is this communicating with you? You're looking, you know, I love preaching in America because normally you get a really good response. <laughs> which means you can say things like, Amen. Amen. And Hallelujah. I come from England and we've learned over the years when we preach, never ever judge anything by the faces of the people that you're preaching to. <laughs> it's all happening on the inside. <laughs> you, you just don't happen on the inside in this country. It happens outwardly. I totally believe that there's a revelation we need that everything that's declared in the word of God about the church is absolutely possible right here today. It's the same gospel. It's the same Holy Spirit. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we are the same church. The amazing thing about the early church is they made mistakes, they fell out with one another, they got things wrong, they, 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 they just had issues that they always had to deal with. They were exactly the same as you and me. There was no difference. Maybe the only difference is this, that they passionately had been ruined and they had this vision of a local church as we are describing. They were vibrant, they were robust. If you read through the whole of the rest of the book of Acts, you find again and again this dynamic company of people. They were not perfect, but they displayed the glorious church, the kind of church that Jesus is building and wants to build today. You go, it's not just the Acts of the Apostles. All the way through the New Testament, you see model after model of what we're talking about this morning. This is not weird stuff. 
<clears throat> this is actually proclaimed stuff. So Ephesians, for example, in chapter 1, you have a picture of the church where Jesus is the head and we are the body. And he describes the church like this, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Wow! What an statement of the church. I thought church was just the building that I go to occasionally on a Sunday. No. <laughs> the Bible says we are the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. You turn over to chapter 2, and it says in Ephesians 2, 19, we were strangers and foreigners and aliens, but we've come together, and Jesus is building his church, and we are like a temple which will grow up and become the place of God's dwelling by his spirit. The church is where God's presence is felt and is manifest amongst us. I'm trying to get you to view churches differently, some of you as you view it already. I love Jesus, I pop along to a building, and I go home and I get on with my life. That is not the vision of the early church or scripture. This is the place where God's presence dwells. We're not talking about four walls. We're talking about being a community in Visalia. Everywhere we go, we're the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Everywhere we go, we are the dwelling place of God by his spirit. You go to work tomorrow morning, you have no idea the impact you're making there without even opening your mouth. Why? Because Jesus, who said, I will never leave you or forsake you, has gone with you to work. Christianity is not a Sunday thing. It is every, it's 24-7 every day of the week. We see as we turn over into chapter 3, it says this in verse 10. Through the church, the manifest wisdom of God is on display for all who see it. That's an amazing statement. It's through the church the wisdom of God is manifest. I live in a nation where no one knows how to relate to people. No one knows how to handle their money. No one knows how to raise their kids. No one knows what is right and wrong anymore. And here we are, the church. And we have the answers to all those dilemmas that people are facing. Church is amazing. Church is wonderful. Church is a place of extraordinary things that happen. You turn over into chapter 4 of Ephesians and you find another display of the church, which is a company of people like a body who are growing and emerging and, and they're becoming mature and every part of the body plays its part and Jesus is the head and it's just a glorious growing and growing and growing community. You get into Ephesians chapter 6 and you find it's a church that's at war. Principalities and powers... And, and you find that there's battles going on and the church is this victorious company of people right in the midst of warfare that wins and wins and wins because Jesus has already run the victory. Boom! I've just given you the whole book of Ephesians and some churches take a year to get through it and I just did it in three minutes. It's, it's just like picture, 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 picture. What kind of church are we supposed to be? There it is in Ephesians. Go read Ephesians this afternoon. Start to get imbibed with this amazing sense of what churches is and what it's meant to be like. Folks, a Christian isn't somebody that just has got saved and has a ticket saying, I'm going to heaven. A Christian is somebody who is allowing the gospel to transform every part of their lives seven days a week and is caught up in this corporate mission called church, which has the ability to change the planet. I think that's a better definition of a Christian. I think that's what we all are and what we're really called to do. Your local church. This local church. Now, some of you are going to miss this, so I'll say it carefully. Your local church, this local church, is the most exciting thing that's happening on planet Earth right now. It's all gone very quiet. Some of you are thinking, you have to be kidding. It's kind of like, this is church, and it's the most exciting thing on planet Earth. There's, one of, there's a scripture in the Old Testament about us, the people of God. It says, we shall be the joy of the whole earth. And sometimes I look at my people coming into the meetings on Sunday mornings, and I stand and look at them, and they come in like this. And I want to say to some people, behold, the joy of the whole earth <laughs> is just gathering this morning. And, and, and the, long, the deal is this. The longer you've been a Christian, the longer you know how to look like a Christian. Have you noticed that? So you were getting ready to come to this morning. I mean, you're the 11 o'clock people, so you don't have excuses but, you know, about getting on time. Because you all get here on time, every one of you. 
But the reality is sometimes you're rushing to get here on time. And there's those moments, aren't there, where your children are not ready and you're trying to get them ready. They've got to clean their teeth. And you get all the children in the car. Do you know who's the last one to get in the car? Your wife. Because she is still making herself look beautiful because of the meeting that we're going to come to. And you slowly get in the car and one of the kids traps their finger in the car and starts screaming. And everything inside of you is going, we're going to church, we're going to church. Would you children please behave yourself? You park your car, you walk in, there's a steward. And the steward says, good morning. And you say, good morning. (laughs) Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Children. Let us go into the house of the Lord. (laughs) No one has any idea what's going on in the inside of you. It's just, we we just get to know how to behave in these ways. This is the most exciting thing happening on planet Earth. And as I watch presidents getting appointed... And then other presidents get appointed. As I watch nations like mine, who's been part of a continent for thousands of years, decide that we're not going to be part of it anymore. <laughs> we just, 2016 is like the whole world's watching at one another and going, you did what? You <laughs> voted for what? What are you doing? And there's so much instability around all over the place. Yeah. People put their foot on something and it moves. It's kind of like no nation in the world knows anything anymore. I actually think God's behind the whole thing. The Bible says in the last days, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Because there's one kingdom that cannot be shaken. It's the kingdom of God. And folks, we're it. We are the local church. This is why this is the most... You have come this morning to the most exciting thing that's happening in California and happening in this nation and happening in the whole globe. And my church just met in London this morning. They're eight hours difference They've, they're all going to bed right now but they just experienced the most exciting thing happening on planet earth and we're experiencing it here today you need this revelation this is not just not like, you know you hear people like us i'm a christian i suppose i've got to go to church it's a million miles away from the vision of this early church that we can today experience ourselves <clears throat> and when you've got this re- vision and you've got this revelation it ruins you. You just can't give your life to anything else. You say, Dave, I'm just a busy guy. I'm a businessman. I drive all over the, the I, I, I fly all over the world. I've got <clears throat> lots of kids. How can I possibly think that this is the thing I'm giving my life to? Somehow we have to find a way in our busy lives to prioritize and get things sorted. And I've got guys in my church that <clears throat> are at the, just doing amazing things through their work and trying to encourage them. That church isn't just a Sunday morning thing. But where you are, you're expressing the kingdom of God in your location and in that place. Please, Lord, give us this revelation. Give us a revelation that it wasn't just for then, it's for now. And please, Lord, ruin us for everything that's going on around us, for your glory. This guy called Bill Hybels and... um, in the 1970s, early 1970s, he um, was a student and he went along to a lecture and this lecture was about <clears throat> the local church. And he says, I sat down at the back of this lecture and folded my arms and stretched out my legs because I was going to have a sleep. <laughs> and then he says that it was like there was a spiritual ambush. <laughs> I love that a spiritual ambush that was about to happen in his life. And the, and the lecturer stood out from his notes, and he was talking on Acts 2, 42, 47, the passage we read this morning. And he said, he said, students, there was once a community of believers who were totally devoted to God, that their life together was charged with the Spirit's power. And in that band of Christ followers... Believers loved one another with a radical kind of love. They took off their masks, shared their lives. They laughed and cried and prayed and sang and served together in authentic Christian fellowship. And those who had more shared freely with those who had less. Barriers melted away. People related together in ways that bridged gender and racial chasms and celebrated cultural differences. Acts 2 tells us that this community of believers, this church, for all these 
were so attractive that unbelievers came and caught a vision of life that was so beautiful they took their breath away. It was bold, creative, dynamic, and they couldn't resist it. And verse 47 says, the Lord added to their number daily those who had been saved. And then he says this, the, the lecturer's unscripted words were like a lament. As they were as much a lament as they were a dream. A sad longing for the restoration of the first century church. This is what Bill Hybel says. I had never imagined a more compelling vision. In fact, that day, I didn't just see the vision. I was seized by it. Suddenly, there were tears in my eyes and a responsive chord rising up in my soul. Where, I wondered, had that beauty gone? Why was that power not evident in the contemporary church? Would the Christian community ever see that potential realized again? And since that day, I have been held hostage to the powerful picture of the Acts 2 dream painted in that college classroom. In the weeks and months after that first lecture, I was haunted with questions. What if a true community of God could be established in the 21st century? What if what happened in Jerusalem could happen in Chicago? Such a movement of God would transform this world and usher people into the next. I was ruined, utterly captured by a single vision of the potential beauty of the church. In 1975, that led me and my colleagues to start a church. And now, almost 40 years later, that vision still rivets my attention, sparks my passion, and calls forth the best effort that I can give. People all over the world are ruined. People all over different nations are ruined to see this glorious vision of the church become a reality. There are three things we need to know about the local church that I'd like to share with you. Can you, can you stay with me for another 15 minutes? Is that all right? Good. The first is this. The first thing you need to know about church is this is God's plan A. And there is no plan B. You are not going to wake up tomorrow morning and find that God's saying to you, do you know all those dreams we had about the church? They didn't work, did they? So we're scrapping it. <laughs> and we're now coming up with a new idea. That is never going to happen. Do you know why? Because it doesn't matter how many Christians get disillusioned with church. Jesus will never be disillusioned with his church. It doesn't matter how many times as Christians we say, well, we'll just forget church. We'll just, it's, we'll, or some of us even just put up with church. Jesus is not just putting up with us. He loves us. He gave his life for us. He thinks that through us the world can come to know Jesus. He thinks that we are God's instrument. He is not going to have plan B. He doesn't regret a single promise he ever made about us as his people. Sometimes I promise things to people. And I wish I hadn't because I don't have the ability to come up with what I promised. Jesus promised things. He has no regrets about anything. He's not looking at the church in the world thinking, oh my goodness, why was I so enthusiastic in the early, in the early days? I mean, look at the mess that we've created. He's not even thinking like that. <clears throat> Sometimes when I'm preaching, I say things that I know I shouldn't be saying. I can see my wife going, don't go there. But it's too late. My words have already gone out. And it's kind of like sometimes I think when I'm preaching like that, I'm going, I'd love to get them all back. Jesus didn't say things about us and thinking, oh, I should wish I hadn't said that. He's passionate about us. He really believes that when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we can be the kind of church some of us are getting ruined for this. It's God's plan A. You know what I really love about God's plan? <clears throat> he didn't say to us, okay, I've done what I've got to do, now it's up to you. All the best. Good luck. Maybe we'll see you at the end. Do you know what he did? He said, this is what I'd love you to be, and I'm going to come. And I'm going to be with you. Because I'm alive and I won't leave you as orphans. Not only that, he says, actually none of you are going to build this thing. I am going to build it. This is not going to be built by your elders. I will, 
I will manifest my shepherding heart through elders. But God doesn't need elders to do. He doesn't need anybody or anything. He has just chosen that this is the way that he will manifest his love and his mercy. But the reality is Jesus is quite capable of doing everything on his own. He is the one who's building his church and he's here. The Bible says he died and dealt with our sin. He rose from the dead and dealt with the problem of death. And it doesn't end there. It then says, and he ascended and sat down at the right hand of God on high. And some of us need to grasp yeah. what this means. Yeah. Sitting down means everything that I've come to do for you has been accomplished. Every time I look up and I see that Jesus has sat down at the right hand of the Father, it reminds me that everything that's needed for the church to be a glorious church he has already accomplished. And he's the name above every name. He is far above all principalities and powers. And here's the amazing news. No one else is ever going to sit on that seat. There's only one seat reserved for one person. The Bible says Jesus did not grasp equality with God, but emptied himself. Therefore, God has raised him. And God has raised him to sit down at the right hand of the Father on high. Everything that's ever been promised about the church is going to come to pass. For one simple reason, Jesus promised it and he sat down. The outcome of every battle has already been won. The outcome of every problem, difficulty, trial, he has already won the victory over everything. We're not trying to make church work. He has sat down. <clears throat> the reality is it's going to work because Jesus is building his church. There's two, we two ways to sit. One is passive and one is active. And sometimes we think Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father means Jesus kind of crawls into heaven exhausted. <laughs> Please, can someone give me a seat? And he sits down. Oh, it is finished. Everything has been accomplished. And he sits down. It's a bit like some of the wonderful chairs that I sit on in America particularly. We have a little lever and it pulls the little, little thing up beneath you. <laughs> And you sit down like that. And you find your arms folding. And if you've got a really smart chair, it even goes backwards at the same time. And in the end, your sitting down is now lying down. You're not caring about anybody else. This is saying to everybody that comes into the room, do not disturb me. I am passive. Sometimes when you're preaching from the pulpit, you see people like that. Did you know that every time Travis preaches, he can see every single person that's here? And uh, sometimes you're kind of like, oh. When Jesus sat down, he sat down actively. It's kind of like he sat down and he's watching. And he's leaning into us. We have this uh, athlete called Mo Farah. Um, if any of you are into athletics, you'll know this guy. He won two golds in the 2012 Olympic Games. He then in 2016 went to Brazil and he won them both again. 5,000 meters, 10,000 meters. He's an absolute phenomena. We love him. And I remember at the 2012 Olympic Games watching him come around the final bend of the 5,000 meters. I mean, how do people run 5,000 meters and run the last lap twice as fast as all the other laps? I just don't understand it. And round the corner he comes, but he's got two or three people with him. And I'm going, I'd love you to win the gold. I'd love you to win the gold, but I'm not, sure, sure, not so sure that you can. And then these guys get closer to him. And then he pulls away. And when he pulls away, I think, Mo, you can do it. I've now become a personal friend of Mo. And I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm shouting at him. I'm saying, Mo, go, go, go. Win the gold, win the gold. And I'm not passive. I'm not eating popcorn thinking, Mo, I hope you make it. I am shouting at the screen. Get over that line. And then you kind of realize when you're shouting that the whole of the United Kingdom is screaming at the television set, yearning that he should, reach the he should win the gold. And then you realize, actually, Mo never won the gold. The United Kingdom did. We raised him up as we shouted at him, and we lifted him across the line, and he won the gold medal. We were not passive. Jesus is looking at us as his church. He sat down. Do you know what the Bible says? He ever lives to intercede. He's here. He's going, church, come on. Keep going. Don't give up. When people start to say things and 
Christians hurt you and you get upset and you, your leadership leads you down, keep going. Come on, come on. It's wonderful to know this morning we have a king who's seated on a throne, who's won victories and he's just saying, come on church, get into everything that I have for you. Come on, do this. The second thing is this, very quickly, running out of time. The church is the answer for the world. I know some of us have struggles with that. We say, that preacher's preaching error. Jesus is the answer to the world. Yes, he is. The gospel is the answer to the world. Yes, that's true. But you have to understand in the economy of God, he has demonstrated the gospel and his own life through the local church. This is why we need to plant churches all over the world. Churches that are the kind of churches that Jesus is building. Not the kind of churches where leaders no longer believe the Bible and think they can do it without the Holy Spirit. But churches where people are passionate about the Word of God and passionate about the Spirit and the grace of God and love the sense of impacting our communities. And, and when we're in a church community that's like that, we understand that the gospel which is proclaimed also needs to be demonstrated. I cannot stand here this morning and preach to you that God is love unless there's a demonstration of that love that we display to one another. It doesn't mean anything. It's just the word. What did the preacher preach on speech this morning? He preached that God is a God of love. But if you're not a Christian, it's not impressive. Because actually, you're already thinking, well, if there's a God of love, then why does he allow that to happen? And why does he allow that to happen? If he really is a God of love, why doesn't he do this? <clears throat> the demonstration of the love of God is manifest through the church. It's manifest through the people of God. Christian TV doesn't do that. We don't plant Christian TV, TV centers all over the world so people can sit in front of TV sets. The church is the place where there's a demonstration of what the gospel can... And so people come amongst us and they say, I didn't just hear a preacher preach on God is love. I saw it. It's interesting, Barnabas was sent down to a church to see whether this church were the real deal. And this is what he says, I saw the evidence of the grace of God amongst them. He doesn't say, I heard some good sermons, so there must be Christians. He said, I saw the evidence of the sermons. We, the local church, are the... Uh, the Visalia needs churches like this that display the glory and the power and expression of God. The church really is the answer. We need to plant loads of churches. Up and down this valley, more and more churches. There's plenty of room. Come on, let's go and do this. So there might be a manifestation of this. Let's go to Sacramento. Let's build a church like this. It's not that there are not other churches like this. There are, praise God, millions of people like us who believe this stuff. But we're here. and We've got a part to play to transform this part of California. And it'll only happen with people who, yes, love Jesus, but are ruined with a passion for the local church. Third and final thing is this. The local church is the soil where God plants me as a believer so that me, the seed of God, has come into my It's an imperishable seed that's come into my heart. And he doesn't just leave me as a Christian on my own. The first thing he does, 1 Corinthians 12, we are all being baptized by one spirit into one body. So if you're a Christian here this morning, God's intention is to take you and place you into a people group called the church. And it's soil so the seed that God's put in you can start to grow. Yeah. So I can say this really lovingly. You will never grow as a Christian outside of the local church. That's how important the local church is. I've got people, I mean, London is just full of Christians who don't belong to a church. There are thousands of them. I meet them sometimes in different churches when I preach. Oh, you were in that church last week. Yeah, well, we're checking it out. Well, you know, are we checking? They're floating around, checking out all the time. You know, you know what they're doing. They're looking for a perfect church. And you know the moment they join it, that's the, that's the time it's no longer perfect. It's kind of like we're always looking. There isn't a perfect church. But God places us. This is a church that's got some good soil. I will say to any of you, get into a church where there's good soil because there you will grow. 
I have found in my own life that the church is the place where I learn so many things. I love the local church. It's the place where I grow. It's the place where I get changed. It's the place where I get challenged. It's the place where I uh, get connected and encouraged. It's where I discover who I am. It's where I discover what my gifts are and what my gifts are not. It's where I discover what I'm good at. It's where I discover where I'm bad at. It's where I discover that I get frustrated with people. I always think church would be wonderful if there were no people in it. I mean, it would be wonderful. But I find that when I become a Christian, I'm stuck with a whole lot of people that I wouldn't spend any of my time with normally. Why is that? Because it's all part of me growing up. I hang out with people I don't naturally want to hang out with. Some of you sit in your small groups and you look around sometimes and you think everybody in this group is really weird. I mean, they're just so different to me. There's nothing we've got in common, naturally speaking. Do you know what? They're all sitting there looking at you and they're thinking exactly the same thing. (laughs) Christians are weird. They're, They're strange people to hang out with. They kind of irritate you and they upset you and they say things and it's all with you don't understand some people say I've left that church why because someone hurt me you just missed the whole point stay get over your hurt learn some things and get changed people are there to change us one preacher once said God either blesses you or afflicts you with people according to your needs I think it's outstanding that's been the story of my whole life do you know what it's called church if I, if, if I left church every time I got hurt, I'd never be in church. We've missed it. We've not realized this is a, the body of Christ is an amazing place where we can, be, we can grow and move forward. I have to say to you, I've found as an isolated Christian, I am very needy. I need people. Sometimes people, when you say that sort of thing, say you, that's a real weakness for someone who leads a church to say that. No, it's not. It's a strength. When I'm weak, then I'm strong the bible says i can't i need people church is a place where we need one another it's glorious now church we had one wonderful family who he was an elder with me for many years and now he's gone to be an elder in another church and they had three kids and then they had a fourth kid who was born with down syndrome his name's joel and he was raised in our church he's 30 years old now he was raised in our church and i don't know what happened but he and i became best buddies I loved Joel. I still do. And he and I had just this funny relationship with one another. We even had kind of little clips of films that we used to say to one another. He was a Shrek fan, and so was I. And he'd often come, and come to me, and, and rather than saying, hi, Dave, he would just quote a, a, a piece of Shrek, and I'd quote it back to him. Do you know what? The impact that this Down syndrome kid made on us as a church was phenomenal. And we're living in an age where... the Many people in in the earth want to get rid of people like this. The day that happens will be a massive tragedy because these people are members, and they're members not only of the human race, but they're members of our communities. And Joel was just a constant encouragement to me. He always used to come up to me and put two thumbs up after I'd preached a sermon, and he would say, Great preach, Dave! I'd say, Thank you, Joel. And he always hugged me and clung on to me. And me to him. Sometimes I come in meeting to meetings feeling really fed up with something. Joel doesn't get that you're fed up. So he just run up and jump on top of me. Joel, don't you understand? I'm really hassled at the moment with all the problems of the people in this church. <laughs> just doesn't get it. It was an amazing moment when, um, when he was baptized by his two elder brothers. And it was a day in our church where we honored the weak member of our church. If you'd asked anyone in our church, do you know Joel? The answer would be everyone knew him. Why? Because he made a massive impact. I don't know anywhere in the world that that doesn't happen. Sometimes I preached really bad sermons, and Joel came up to me, and he'd say, Great preach, Dave! And I knew it wasn't a great preach. Everybody else was avoiding me because they knew it wasn't a great preach. But Joel doesn't get that. One day he came up to me and said, Great preach, Dave! And then someone told me, you do realize he wasn't even in the meeting. He wasn't even there. (laughs) I love it. It's called the body of Christ. It's the people who change the world. Let me finish with this. It's kind of like there's an invitation for some of us today. I appreciate that people 
have had bad experiences of church. Some of you, even here in Radiant, and you've been here for a few years, you're still slightly nervous. You still hold back a little bit. I pray that today we've encouraged you. Get a revelation. And, and honestly, read this. I can't persuade you. I'm, I'm going to get on a plane and go back to the UK. I can't persuade you on my own. But you can be persuaded by studying the word of God yourself and coming out the other end and saying, do you know what? That is an amazing vision. That's something worth giving my life for. That's something worth being ruined for. And I want to close with this. The invitation to give yourself to Jesus, which kind of means giving yourself to what he's doing on planet Earth, which is the local church, is an invitation that's got guaranteed success written all over it. The invitation is to invest your life, your time, your money, your energy into something that cannot fail. Because Jesus said, I will build my church. So can he do it? I think the answer is yes. He's risen from the dead. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. And then he says, I will do this. It's a wonderful, wonderful promise. He's going to do it. Do you know, if we mess up and go somewhere else, he'll still keep doing it because it's all dependent upon him. And there's an invitation to us today to say, come on, give yourself to the purposes of God. And the amazing thing is this, when you get to a place where you see the church is being changed to be more like the church we read about in the word of God, there's one final thing that comes clearly through, and that is this. It's not just about getting the church right. It's about equipping people in the church to live right so that we might impact the world around us that doesn't know Jesus. There's too many churches that are insular, too many churches that have done church, done well, but they've ended up closed in upon themselves. That's death right there. Churches in the United States may have been able to exist because there's a lot of churchy kind of people around. But that doesn't mean it's going to stay like this forever. There's actually a generation growing up in the United States that are not interested in what we're doing even here this morning. And I love those people. They are the ones that are the future of the church. They're the ones to invest our lives in. And for that to happen, let's do church as the Bible says, believing that as we do and equip one another, we'll reach a generation that doesn't know Jesus. There are people in this nation that still don't know Jesus. Did you know that? They sit with you at work. They live down the road. They're at your gym. They're wherever you are, and there's multitudes of them. And they've never, they might have heard about Jesus, but they have no living reality of him in their lives. Let's pray. Lord, would you please continue to give us revelation by your spirit, through your word, of the kind of church that you are building today. I thank you so much. This is not some fairy story written over 2,000 years ago that is never reality. I believe with all my heart that your word is there so that we can be this. Whether it's in Visalia, Sacramento, San Francisco, all up and down this great place of California, you have a church that you are going to build that's going to make such an impact. And would you please ruin some people here today, Lord? We can't go anywhere else. We just have to catch this vision and live for it. I ask it, Lord Jesus, for your glory. Amen. Thanks, Dave. Some of you share Dave's passion, um, and some of you have at one point in your life shared Dave's passion, but you've been disappointed. And passionate people who get disappointed get cynical. Yep. And uh, Danny uh, gave a word uh, just about coming in here and finding protection. And I know that your hurts are valid. But I also know that we hold on to our hurts in order to protect ourselves. We don't want to become vulnerable again. We don't want to put our hearts out there again. We actually hold our hurts. Instead of releasing those, instead of forgiving, we hold on to those things to protect ourselves. And if you remember what Danny shared, uh, there is an invitation. You don't have to protect yourself because it's just not going well, is it? Avoiding pain, 
avoiding hurt. Anybody doing a good job of that? Uh, I try hard and usually fail. It's a bit like avoiding gravity. The invitation is not to hold on to your hurt and to protect your uh, heart. Can I show you a picture? This is a caricature. You can have this done at the Tulare County Fair in September, or you can go to Magic Mountain and they'll draw you. And what they do is they exaggerate your features. So your nose, your ears, your teeth, they blow it out of proportion. And many times when I'm harboring or we're harboring hurt, we exaggerate things. We focus on certain things. We blow things out of proportion. And I feel like there's an invitation for us this morning to come away from our hurt, to move out of what we've held on to, to protect our hearts and to trust Jesus again. Jesus uh, encountered a man who was crippled and asked him a question. The question is, do you want to be healed? And the man launched into his story, a story he had told many times about why he's in the position he's in and why he's not been healed. Jesus asked him a question, and he told a story. And I feel this morning like there's just a real clear invitation for us, a real clear question. Don't be caught telling the same story and holding on to your hurts to protect your heart. I have that same opportunity. Mark's had that same opportunity. He's been fired from churches. I left his church. He was hurt not just by the church, but by me. Dave also lost his job at a church. Dave could tell you horror stories about the church. But don't be caught exaggerating thing, things, focusing on features, blowing them out of proportion. If you're going to blame the church, then blame it properly. Blame it properly. Blame it not just for the bad, but for the good. When you think about that pastor who let you down, the only reason he was able to let you down is because you loved him and he loved you and he poured his life into you. And I feel like there's something we're to do to end, which is just to bless the church. Yeah. There's so much complaining about the church. I've had it. I've had it. We started a church because it was, um, we found it so much easier just to complain about the church. And I feel like, would you join me in standing? Many of you have been hurt by the church. You've come from another church. But I feel like either out loud or in your heart, actually, I feel like it'd be important to move your mouth. I feel like we're supposed to bless. We're supposed to bless those churches that we were a part of, those people that hurt us. Would you bless those? Bless those, maybe even enemies that you have, that you would bless them with your mouth that you would bless that pastor, that church, those people who poured their lives into you, that we have an opportunity to speak well of what Jesus is speaking well of. You know what I'm saying? So would you join me in just a few, just, just for a few minutes to close? Jesus, we thank you for the church. We've complained, we've griped. We thank you for those churches. I thank you for Savior's Community Church and the people there that pour their lives into me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you uh, for the memories that I have as a child at Calvary Chapel here in Visalia and what was invested in my family during that time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the leaders that you've given us. Bless those leaders by name. Bless them. Lord, we bless your church. We don't want to curse what you're doing on the earth. We want to bless it. We want to see it grow, Lord. We want to walk out of our hurts and into this vision of a glorious church with a glorious end, an eternal community that just can't be stopped, a kingdom that's advancing. We bless other churches around town. Lord, we don't have the corner on the market. We're so young. We know so little, but we bless the other churches. A blessed Grace Community Church. Bless them, Lord. Would you walk from here and instead of telling your stories, would you bless and uh, blame them, not just for the bad that's gone on, but also for the good that's been invested in your life. I'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. 
So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea and all the beautiful things here in life. And I